from sea to shining sea, and everywhere in between. Wherever you are around the country, this is America's Outdoor Talk program, Outdoors This Week. Outdoors This Week. Get the kids, get the dog, get the cat, sit them all down next to the radio. We are going to be talking about the great outdoors today. And now, with America's latest news and talk on the great outdoors. This is a dangerous place, man. You've got thousand pound bears wanting something that you have. Here's your host, Alex Langer. Why, thank you, Mr. Announcer. That would be I, your humble host, and we have a huge show today. I know I know, I usually pull your leg, but today I'm pulling your leg also. We have with us none other than Jacob Poroznik. Jacob is an FLW competitor, and this coming year, in, in, in 2014, he's going to go over to the Bass Elite Series. Jacob started fishing in the Bass Fishing League and eventually moved his way up to the Everstart and FLW Series circuits. 2012 was a great season for Jacob. He finished runner-up behind his good friend Dave Dudley in the FLW Tour, and he notched three top 10 victories, including in 2012, including a second-place finish at Lake Champlain, which is his favorite lake, and he is currently fishing the FLW Tour. But next year, he'll be fishing the BASS Elite Series. I'm going to ask Jacob everything about his style of fishing and how he got to be so good on the FLW Tour. And then, of course, we have all of our usual suspects. We have Ron Lindner from Lindner. Angling Edge. Then we have Sammy Lee from... from Tight the, Lines. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> I, I almost called Sammy Lee good old what's the name. Good old what's, uh, his, good old name. what's his name is Wade Bourne. <laughs> then we have good old Wade Bourne. Wade is going to be talking hunting today. So stay with us, folks. We'll be right back. Don't go away. More of America's favorite outdoor talk program, Outdoors This Week, after these messages. Hi folks, Ron Lindner here for Lindner's Angling Edge Television. Seen on the Pursuit Channel every Saturday early afternoon. Okay, I'm currently doing an article for the North American Fisherman. Uh, North American Fisherman has a uh, quite an extensive circulation, 425,000 last I heard. It's one of the larger uh, magazines out there today. At any rate, the title is Anchors Away, well, sort of. Anchoring, at least proper anchoring, was considered one of the fine arts of fishing. Yeah, I mean, you, you were a good anchor, you you were indulged in the fine arts. Through the years, though, technology developed and things like GPS, depth finders, absolute uh, accurate maps, trolling motors with spot lock, back trolling and drifting and alike tended to put anchoring uh, uh, as a prime methodology on the back shelf. A little background is, is necessary. Back in the day, anchoring was the mode. This is the days of the 12 and 14 foot wooden boats, the hour locks and the, uh, maybe you had a six horsepower motor on the back and uh, not all the people owned depth finders. Uh, actually, they were flashers in those days. And uh, uh, you did, you, a lot of depth was determined by metered strings with weights. And you'd go out there and probe around and you'd throw some empty bottles that were wrapped with a string and some weights and you'd mark off an area. And these, you, you kind of figure, uh, I'm going to draw a, a drift troll or anchor or do something in this area. And uh, you might uh, throw a split shot with a night crawl around or you might... Uh, uh, you might use a bomber with a minnow on it or, or maybe cast an area with a plug or a spoon. Uh, these various methods were, were in use. Over the years, however, uh, bass anglers in particular kind of stopped anchoring. They uh, they'd still do it. Now, the shiner fishermen with guides, which would pull up in Florida, you see them, they, they, they pull up there, you they anchor down and they put these corks out with these shiners and they float them in against uh, heavy cover. Uh, they still do that today, but by and large, most bass fishermen, they keep, uh, they, they keep untied, as it were. They figure that with the machinery they have today, that they can hover in spots long enough uh, to, to properly fish it down. 
And in a walleye world, uh, they they would anchor uh, in areas that fish with leeches. This was, they still do that till today. Uh, anchoring as a system has not went away, but it has markedly decreased, or or, or, or I got until recently with the innovation of talons and and power poles, which you see on the back these little towers you see on the backs of these boats. Anchoring is coming back into its own. Uh, Minn Kota's Talon, you can now anchor, or, or what we call pin anchor, in 12 foot of water with the press of a button. Bink, it's out. You, you want to go leave? Oh, you press the button. Ah, it's all the way up. And it does hold you, even in a pretty darn good wind. And uh, so, uh, and by the way, I hear they're, they're even working on, no, I shouldn't even say, yeah, I'll say it anyway. They're working on 16 foot models as, as we speak. Uh, they got ways of doing this. So, with these new anchors, uh, talons, and these power poles, anchoring is coming back to its own. These guys are, particularly bass fishermen, they're, they're, they're positioning themselves uh, between maybe a very complicated dock layout. You know, there's a lot of number of docks, and they got all kinds of offshoots and stuff. They'll position themselves, they'll, they'll, they'll pull down, and we call it taloning down. Talon down! And... and from this position, lock themselves out and really cast out. You know, shoot it underneath the uh, the dock itself. Shoot it under the boat. Shoot it under the side of the uh, the canopy. You know that kind of stuff. So, anchoring more. And, oh, they're also anchoring in stump fields. And my son Jimmy just came from a, a tournament up in Leech Lake where they got these big rice beds, and he says these guys were talenting down constantly out in these big rice beds, and they were flipping. Uh, the, the, uh, the real heavy weight weighted jigs, uh, punch crawling they call it. You know, uh, uh, ounce and a half sinker with a six or f- four rod or five rod or six rod hook, heavy duty w- with a craw on the back, and 65 pound test braid and a, a seven and a half foot flipping stick with the seven to one gear ratio. They'll flip that thing out there at three and a half four feet of water. Bass picks it up. I don't care how big he is. They rip jaws. My son just got through doing this. He came back and he didn't. He didn't understand something. I says I fish a lot down in Okeechobee. I practice with some of the best punch crawlers in the world. These guys tape their wrists because when you set the hook on a five or six pound bass in four foot of water with sixty five pound test braid, there's it, it, there's no give. So you better have your wrists just like a fighter. So what they do is they get the tape. You, you buy the tape. You know, that basketball players and a lot of uh, uh, athletes use. And what they're doing is they're wrapping their wrists. They're using this in conjunction with talenting down anchoring. So anchoring is back, by the way. So the long lost art, they're starting to rediscover something that everybody used to do years ago. With that, well, see you later, folks. Larry Whiteley and the Outdoor World Report are proudly brought to you by the brand new Rototail, the world's first and only plastic worm with a soft rotating spinner tail. The patented tail generates unbelievable vibration that you and the fish can actually feel just like a spinner bait or a crankbait. See it at rototail.com. That's rototail.com. Dove tips coming up on Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Have you ever wanted to disappear into the woods? Have you ever wanted to tie your own flies, but never taken the time? Have you ever wanted to speak turkey? When you belong at Bass Pro Shops, every week we offer free skills workshops to help you get started. See the store or go to BassPro.com for more information. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. When you spot a dove, don't raise your gun until the bird is within shooting range. If you pull your shotgun up too early, the bird might see the movement and flare out of range. Shooting glasses with yellow lenses can help you to spot doves on cloudy days because they give greater contrast, making the doves stand out. In bright sun, polarized sunglasses are good because they cut the glare. Don't think all of the best shooting on a dove hunt will occur early or in the final hour or two of daylight. Throughout the afternoon, there will be often be flurries of dove activity as groups of birds fly in and out of fields for 5 to 10 minutes. Now, you don't have to build or put up a blind or find a well-hidden spot for dove hunting, but do stand or sit next to some form of cover. Remember, folks, there are two ways of being rich. 
One is to have all you want. The other is to be satisfied with what you have. Get out and enjoy all the great outdoors has to offer. I'm Larry Whiteley, and this is Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Thanks a lot, Larry. My guest for this hour is Jacob Poroznik. Now, Jacob is an FLW Series competitor. He has won nearly a million dollars in career winnings. He started his bass fishing in the Bass Fishing League and eventually moved his way up through the Everstart and FLW Series. In 2012 was a stellar season for Jacob. He finished runner-up behind his good friend Dave Dudley in the point standing. He has notched three top ten victories in 2012, including a second-place finish in Lake Champlain, and he's currently fishing the FLW Tour again this year. First of all, Jacob, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you mentioned Dave Dudley quite a bit. What is it about Dave Dudley that you admire? Uh, this is, uh, I guess, his capability just to uh, adjust during, you know, during the day. You know, you know, we have three days of practice, so we kind of go out and find the fish, kind of what they're doing, and then, you know, kind of when the tournament gets there, you know, things change and stuff like that, and that's where a lot of people have difficulties doing that. And he just, he just fishes by instinct, you know, and just kind of goes, goes, goes throughout the day, you know, and just kind of reads kind of what's going on, you know, and, and just during to weather change and different patterns and stuff that's going on in the Lake or River that we're fishing. The fact that he's flexible and he kind of learns from what's happening on a lake in a particular situation is, is what you admire about him? Yeah, yes. And, and just, you know, just his ability to to be able to read stuff, you know. I mean, he's he's taught me a whole lot about fishing. You know, me and him saltwater fish a lot during the winter, and you know, in in my opinion, just fishing a lot helps you with with all kinds of things. You know, it's making decisions and adjustments. Even even though it's saltwater, it's still making decisions. Where do you fish saltwater, and what kind of species do you go for? Well, we fish out in the ocean a lot of times for stripers during the winter time. You know, just casting to them with uh, like swim baits and. Sassy shads and stuff like that. What state, Jacob? Oh, that's in Virginia. It's in Virginia, North Carolina, right there, kind of like on the border. Yep. Uh, we call it like Nags Head is where we go out of. You go to Nags Head, North Carolina. That's kind of the southern end of the stripers. Yes, sir. And they go from there north. Stripers are very big up in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, where I'm familiar with. Stripers are, in, in some ways, they're a lot like largemouths, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, 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 uh, they feed on bait, you know, so you always got to kind of find the bait. And, you know, the wind direction plays a deal of whether they're close to the beach or if they're off the beach and, and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of all about, you know, a fish is a fish, in my opinion. Right. You know, he, he's going to kind of do the same things other fish do. They Most of them relate around structure sometimes, or they're always around bait. Right. So you're either kind of fishing the same thing if you're bass fishing or crab fishing or striper fishing or, you know, red drum fishing or something like that. There, there's got to be some kind of key element there that you have to find. In reservoirs, bass follow the shad. I guess stripers do the same thing in reservoirs. They also follow bait fish in salt water. If you find the bait fish, if you find what you're fishing for? Absolutely. You know, you, you, you get around the bait, which is their forage, you know. I mean, if you was in a... If you was in a town and there was only one restaurant to eat at, all the people would probably gather around that one restaurant in that, in that town is the, is the way that I look at it. I think I've been to that town, Jacob. It's in the middle <laughs> yeah, of Pennsylvania. So, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of basically the way that and we kind of look at it. You know, put it to my perspective. You know, if 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 there's only one place to eat in that town, then everybody's going to kind of gather there. Same way with a bass. You know, you get in the creeks or reservoirs or rivers or kind of whatever. You know, if the, if all the baits in the backs of the creeks, you know, that's where all the bass are going to be. Right. You know, same thing with stripers. You know, if the baits up real shallow, then that's where they're going to be. You know, and it's it, it, like I said, uh, in my opinion, a fish is a fish. You just kind of kind of got that figure out kind of what's going on right right jacob what's your strength as an angler when i first started fishing you know i was a very i mean I, most of the time i fished shallow and in the last couple of years you know we've been to lakes and stuff where we had to learn how to fish out deep and and, and read fish out there deep around deep structure and, and ledges and drops and you know creek channel bends and stuff like that so you, you know it's 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 been pretty uh you know it's, I, I would say i guess i've been pretty versatile the last couple of years um you know to learn learn about that stuff and everything it used to be guys were spinnerbait mechanics or worm mechanics or whatever you can't just do one thing anymore and be competitive can you no you know but we we just fished uh you know, we fished down to Red River for the FLW championship, and then as soon as I left there, I went straight to um, went straight to uh, Lake Erie, and we were out there at Lake Erie drop shotting six pound test line for four or five pound smallmouth, and you know, twenty to thirty foot of water. So, yeah. you know, it's a big difference of fishing from six inches of water to twenty to five or thirty foot. So, you, you gotta kind of be versatile. Jacob, we gotta take a break, and folks, we'll be right back after this. Don't go away. We'll be right back with the Jacob Parosnik. Stay with us. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Don't change that dial. 
Alex will be right back with more of Outdoors This Week after these messages. Since Tight Lines with Sammy Lee. On my last program, I started talking with country music artist John Anderson about his love of fishing. Hello, this is Sammy Lee. I'll continue talking with John about his fishing experiences with his father after this message. It's the last sound you want to hear when you'd rather be on the water. A tow truck hauling you in because the brakes on your boat trailer failed. Don't let this happen. Make sure your trailer is equipped with unique functional products. UFP, America's leading manufacturer of boat trailer brakes and braking systems. So how come your trailer didn't have UFP brakes? So how come you can't mind your darn business? Unique functional products from people dedicated to making things happen. Don't ask her on a straight to keep the night. She'll start thinking about him and she's ready to fight. I look at the thing that you do. I just came home and count the memories. While talking with country music artist John Anderson, he indicated that his father had started him fishing when he was a youngster. Didn't he, John? Yeah, when I was uh, five years old, he bought me a little uh, open face spinning rig, you know. By the time I was about six or seven, I had his uh, one of his Mitchells, you know. And I just went on from there. <laughs> when Ambassador 5000 uh, became popular in our neck of the woods, uh, went on with that and uh, pretty much learned to fish. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he pretty much taught me how to fish with everything from a cane pole to a deep sea rig. That's pretty good training for a five-year-old uh, he, kid. He, well, I mean, I didn't learn it all when I was five. It, <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to learn, actually, uh, and do have a, a, a lot to learn. But, uh, I, again, I have to give a lot of credit to my dad for teaching me a lot of the basics. And I'll say this, he's a great fisherman himself. Looking back, uh, you know, he was one of the more serious fishermen that I've uh, ever fished with. I'll be back with more tight lines after this. Is this the biggest fishing breakthrough in decades? It's a revolutionary lure that is the most versatile plastic worm I've ever fished with. Ever see a plastic worm with a tail that spins 360 degrees like a spinner? How does it do that? Be amazed at rototail.com. That's rototail.com. This new plastic worm effortlessly goes through any weeds and thick cover. The unique action created by the spinning tail along with the versatility that you can use this lure, it's amazing. It puts to shame or ordinary plastic worms that either do nothing or just wag back and forth. The tail calls fish from long distances and telegraphs what it's doing back to your rod. The vibration that you feel on your rod tip is amazing. I never would have imagined in my wildest dream that a soft plastic spinner, you'd be able to feel the thumping as it comes back to you. Makes a great gift. I believe that the rototail is the next generation of plastic worms. See it work at rototail.com. That's rototail.com. I'll continue talking with John Anderson next time, so I hope you'll join me. I'm Sammy Lee, and until next time, Tight Lines. Tight Lines, brought to you by HuntMate. The ultimate hunting app for your iPhone. By UFP. America's leading maker of brake systems for boat trailers. And by Cheyenne Ridge Signature Lodge. Discover why our lodge earned two Beretta Tridents. Thanks a lot, Sammy Lee. And we have Jacob Poroznik with us today. Jacob is an FLW competitor, and he's, uh, he's won almost a million bucks, if you can believe that, in, in bass fishing. He's got two tournament career wins, and he's got 35 top 10 finishes. He's fished 167 events, and he's, he's been an FLW Tour Pro for 10 years. And, and out of those 10 years, he's appeared in eight FLW Cups. Now, that's pretty darn good, Lynn, don't you think? Jacob and I were just talking about, about fishing, of all things. And uh, let me ask you about Lake Champlain. You were initially a shallow water angler by your own admission. So wh why do you like Champlain? 
Oh, it's just, I mean, you know, the first time I went up there, we uh, got up there, and that was, like, really the first lake that I had ever been to, actually, really smallmouth fishing out deep. And uh, it was, um, you know, just I just fell in love with it and, you know, kind of figured out, like, the first time I was there, kind of what they like to relate to and, and hang to and just kind of done done good every time we've been there. Last time I was in Lake Champlain, I, I took the ferry over it <laughs> with my car. It's a long, narrow lake. And it, it separates Vermont from New York State. It has some incredible fish in it. Did you catch them shallow or deep in that lake? You know, you could catch them. Um, you know, you catch them both ways there. Um, you know, the, the I, I think I've had three or four or five top tens up there in uh, in past tournaments from with FLW. But you know, the one that stands out the most was when I finished second in Angler of the Year and then in second in the tournament to, to Dudley in 2000. Um, actually last year and you know i caught largemouth the whole time i'd never ever fished for largemouth up there before and it was um it was absolutely phenomenal i mean you know the the, the actual lake was kind of a little bit lower than the normal and it had them kind of grouped up you know you could catch you know 60 or 70 a day you know on a chatterbait or a frog or you know flipping a you know plastic uh power hog around or something like that you know it was it was actually pretty cool were these large did you say they were largemouth or were they smallmouth no, they were all they were all larger mouth. Where in the lake did you get them? There's that northern end where there's pilings. Did you catch them in the northern end? No, no. I, I fished down. I fished on the south end. I was running about. I guess it was probably like 60 miles down there to Ticonderoga is what they call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, from up here at Plattsburgh. And, and when you get down there, it just turns into like kind of big grass flats, kind of like we fish on the Potomac River. Right. So it was, you know, it was kind of like I was at home, you know. Craziest thing I've ever heard of, of happening on Lake Champlain. A, a bass boat had a cow fall into it from a steep bank. <laughs> and it actually injured the angler. There's a part of the fishing on, on Champlain that made you feel at home, didn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, it was it's kind of like the Potomac River, you know, a lot of millful and stuff like that, which I'm, you know, accustomed to from fishing down there. But, you know, just for some reason, a whole lot more bass up there. <laughs> right, right. Uh, take me through your techniques. What's your favorite shallow water technique? I mean, I like sight fishing, you know, when the bass are spawning. It's probably my favorite. Right. You know, um, even, I mean, pre-spawn, the spawn, and then right after they get done spawning, you know, because they're always shallow and, and the big ones are always up there and you you can actually kind of, you know, figure out what to catch them on. And another great thing that I love besides sight fishing is, is throwing a wacky worm. You know, it's it's a, it's a technique that, that a lot of people have gotten away from, and, man, it, it still catches the well, snot out of it. Uh, how do you fish a wacky worm? Do you fish it weightless, or do you fish it with a weight in front of it? Um, you can fish it either way. Um, I usually I usually fish it weightless with a, uh, you know, you just put, like, a 2 odd iron hook right in the middle of it. Yep. And, um you know, just kind of skipping around docks, shallow docks and shallow bushes and just lay downs and, and stuff like that, you know, just kind of work it out. And they, 99% of them, you actually see the bass bite it, you know, he'll come out there and get it. it it's funny, me and Dudley I always I come up with a thing, you know, when you pull that wacky worm, like the ends of those tails kind of like clap at you and, and I always say, right. it says, come get me, you know, when you pull it like three times. <laughs> come get I like me. Saying. I get it. Come get me. I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. So what else do you like to do in shallow water? You know, top water fishing, you know, we, we um, just cast a little, you know, pop bars and stuff up around, you know, shallow later and stuff after they're done spawning when they get to garden fry and stuff and, you know, the uh, prop bait and stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, that goes on. It just depends on kind of where you're at, but it um it's it's a it's a pretty neat deal, you know, when they're when the fish are shallow. I mean, I would much rather fish shallow than I would deep, but you know, sometimes you got to do it. I think most people would would agree with you. A lot of people don't know how to fish deep water. Has that been a weakness for you? No, no. You know, we just uh, in, in the like the years past, we never really went to where there was um shallow where there was shallow water. I mean, where there was deep water when we were fishing deep water. But, you know, in the past couple of years, we've been to Kentucky Lake, like Chickamauga, right. stuff like that, where, you know, the time of year you have to get out there and fish deep, you know, which, right. Is, right. which is fine with me now. I mean, I've learned learned really how to do it. So, Jacob, we got to take a break, and we're going to do another segment. So would you come back? Yes, yes, absolutely. Great, great. Well, folks, we'll be right back with the Jacob Parosnik. Don't go away. I'm hooked on hooking up. We'll be back in a moment with more Outdoors This Week with Alex Langer. The only remedy is at the end of my load. 
The Wave Bowen Report is brought to you by the original Alex Langer's Flying Lure. Hey, that's my lure! Hundreds of millions have been sold on TV worldwide for over two decades. It fishes itself and swims away from you on its own. Catches nearly every game fish that's ever swam. See it at FlyingLure.com. That's FlyingLure.com. One thing that can ruin a hunt quicker than just about anything else is getting cold. When you're cold, you lose focus, you lose desire, and a lot of times you'll quit and come in early. Now, Stuart Wilson of Cabela says one main key to staying warm is regulating your body temperature by altering your headgear. I'm Wade Bourne, and this is Wired to Hunt Radio. Today, tips for keeping warm and keeping going when the temperature plummets. More Wired to Hunt Radio coming up. Hey, waterfowl hunters, if you need a shotgun for the new season, check out Mossberg's pumps and autoloaders. They come in black synthetic and camo finishes. They shoot three and three and a half inch shells. They offer great dependability and value. Mossberg is America's oldest family owned and operated firearms manufacturer. Check out Mossberg shotguns online at Mossberg.com. Also be watching for the new series of Mossberg Duck Commander shotguns later this fall. Mossberg, built rugged, proudly American. Cabela's is the world's foremost outfitter for hunting, fishing, camping, and outdoor gear. They offer more gear than anybody, best selection, prices, and quality, all backed by Cabela's legendary guarantee. Shopping with Cabela's has never been easier or more convenient. You can outfit all your needs through Cabela's catalogs, website, and their many stores. Check them out at Cabela's.com. Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter. This is Wired to Hunt Radio. Stuart Wilson is a product manager for hunting apparel and accessories for Cabela's, and he's an expert on what it takes to keep a hunter warm and comfortable in the field. Recently, Stuart and I talked about headgear, and he said that the head is the body's thermostat. It's where the most heat can be conserved or lost, and this is why choosing the right headgear is ultimately important to a hunter's comfort. Here's Stuart with a headgear recommendation that allows hunters to conserve heat or let it escape, depending on the situation. You can buy a neck gaiter, you can buy a face mask, you can buy a, a, a beanie or a full ball of clava. The biggest thing that a hunter really needs to understand is that you lose the most amount of heat through your head and you got to take care of it. So you always want to have some type of neck coverage, either through a gaiter and a minimum of beanie. If you're going in extreme cold conditions, I would definitely suggest what we call a balaclava. It gives you the best of both worlds. You can wear it, covers your full face all the way down through your neck. You're going to get great heat retention, but it also allows you the ability to adjust for conditions. You can pull the top down so it exposes the top of your head and face. You can leave it up. You can wear it in multiple positions to keep you comfortable. That's Stuart Wilson of Cabela's, and you can check out all these items Stuart mentioned on Cabela's website, cabelas.com. And that's today's Wired to Hunt Radio. I'm Wade Bourne saying thanks for listening and get outside. Thanks, Wado. And we have with us Jacob Poroznik today. Jacob is a top competitor on the FLW Tour. He started his career in bass fishing. He started his fishing career with the Bass Fishing League and eventually moved his way up through the Everstart and the FLW Series circuits. 2012 was a stellar season for Poroznik, finishing runner-up behind his good friend Dave Dudley, and he has notched three top ten victories in 2012, including a second-place finish at Lake Champlain. And no, that's not a contradiction. And Jacob, uh, first of all, welcome back, and let's talk about deep water for a little bit. I think electronics have really been a huge boon to fishing deep water to competitors today i mean a lot more so than even 10 or 20 years ago how do electronics help the average competitor well i mean it takes all the guesswork out of it now you know i mean it's you know as far as when we used to have to look at a paper map and, and kind of line up points and you know trees and this window of this house with this tree over here you know to kind of sit at the right spot you know know the depth and everything you know GPSs and, and Navionics and, and Depth Finders have actually taken the, the guesswork out of it. You know, right. um, I, I can I can remember at Kentucky Lake a couple of years ago that the only thing that I did was just idle around and look for actually schools of bass, you know, out on the ledges. And you could see them on your Depth Finder like they were plain as day. And it, like I said, it took the guesswork out of it. I never made a cast hardly during practice, you know, because one thing I did was just idle around and, and I keyed on, you know, my Lawrence Electronics or was was my practice, you know, and 
I went back to the first school that I found the first morning of practice and caught them on every cast for about two hours. You know, there was that many bass there, and it's it's just phenomenal now. But you know, the thing is, like I said, it's it's just made it so easy for everybody to get out there to do it. It's really hard to actually find that one key spot to actually win on anymore. Right. In a way, as good as the electronics are, everybody's got them, so it's an equalizer. It's kind of like the arms race, you know. <laughs> if, yeah, yeah. If, it's actually it's taken away. You know, a lot of guys that that really learned how to do that. You know, in the, in the past, you know, probably five or six years ago, that were really doing good in that. That had spent a lot of time out there fishing deep. You know, it actually killed them because. You know, I mean, the the Navionics chip and Lawrence Electronics and stuff like that, I could find every hole in the lake. What is your favorite way to fish deep? And when when I mean deep, I mean, like, you know, 20 or 30 feet or more. Um, I, I mean, we throw, a, we throw a great big football head on, like, a big 12-inch worm. Yeah. Um, it's kind of my favorite way to fish. You know, you throw it on a big heavy flipping stick, 17 or 20-pound test line, and, I mean, you know, it, it's just it's just the most productive way to fish because you're always feeling, you're always in contact with the bottom, and, Ninety ninety nine percent of the time, when you when you stab him with that football head, he's not getting off. You know, you're throwing a if you're throwing a crankbait or something. If you're throwing a crankbait or something, then uh, then you got to um, you got to uh, actually you know have a chance of losing a big one or two or something like that. But with that football head, you're always in contact with him. A twelve inch worm is an awfully big lure. Uh, did you really mean it was a twelve inch worm? Is it actually a twelve inch worm? Oh yeah, I mean, and, you know, and when we're out there, we catch them. We catch them all the way from six inches to, I mean, from six inches on that 12-inch worm all the way up to, you know, eight or nine pounds. You know, I mean, it, the, the little bass don't shy away from it either. You're absolutely right. A little bass will actually will take a worm that's longer than he is. And a lot, a lot of people don't realize that. I think a lot of really big fish come in the bigger baits as well, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Um, I agree 100%. But, you know, I've caught some, some really big bass on a little baby brush hog and stuff where you would think that, that you know, catching, catching uh, you know, trying to catch a little one but actually catch big ones. So, right. You know, that sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. What are your plans this fall? Are you got anything planned? Um, You know, we're just, uh, my guide for ducks and geese during the fall. Yeah. Um, down in Tabang, like I told you before. But, um, you know, that's basically it. You know, just get ready for the 2014 season. When does the 2014 season start for you? Well, um... This year, um, I qualified for the Bassmaster Elite, so I'm probably not going to be fishing FLW no more. I'm probably going to the Elite side. Really? Uh, so, some people fish FLW, some people fish bass. What's the difference? If you fish both sides, what is the difference? Um, there, there's not really much difference. Um, you know, uh, over there on the uh, over there on the um, on the FLW side, you know, they kind of have their own sponsors, but. On the bass side, you're able to promote your own sponsors, you know. Exactly, exactly. How can people follow you online or find out more about you online? Um, you can check me out on my website at jacobprizes.com or on Facebook, um, either one. All right, so that, that's J-A-C-O-B-P-O-W-R-O-Z-N-I-K. Yep, that's it. What is a derivation of Poroznik? It sounds like either Russian or... or Polish. Or, uh, Polish. Polish. I should have figured it was Polish. Do you have a lot of Polish friends? No, no, no. It, I mean, it just it comes from a long line, you know, down the down through the family. So, but right. you know, no, it's it's nothing like that. I've never been to Poland or anything like that, or you know. Jacob, I'm sorry. We've, we've been having some fun with you, but I hear the music. It's time to go. Thank you very much for joining us. All right. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much. And folks, come on back and see us next time on Outdoors this week. Same time, same place. Alex Langer, Outdoors This Week.